Welcome to Smyrna Christian Church, where the entire Word of God is taught straight from the Bible. Good morning. Welcome back to Smyrna Christian Church, back in the book of Psalms. After we just completed the longest chapter in the Bible, we come to chapter 120, beginning a new set of 15. It's called the Songs of Degrees. And I will mention we're actually going to begin our study in 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 5. Through these, 18, or through these 15 chapters, these 15 songs of degrees, we're going to be learning a great deal about Hezekiah, who is a very righteous king, which is, it's, I mean, it's amazing anyway, but it's kind of even more amazing because his, uh, the king that was the king before him and the king that was king after him were two of the most wicked kings ever. But then in between those, we have Hezekiah, this very righteous king, and we're going to learn so much about him through these 15 chapters. And um, we're going to talk a great deal about it. I think I want to go ahead and get into it. And we'll talk about many things while we're going through the study. So let's ask a word of wisdom from our Father. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We ask you to guide us through this study with your Holy Spirit. We ask you to give us eyes to see and ears to hear to understand and teach your word. We ask that your words be spoken and your will be done during this study. Thank you and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ, precious name. Amen. All right, so we're going 2 Kings chapter 18. And I will mention also, you can read a great deal about Hezekiah in 2 Kings chapters about 18 through 20, and also 2 Chronicles chapter 29 through 32, and Isaiah chapters about 36 through 39. So Isaiah the prophet was prophesying during the reign of Hezekiah. So 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 5, speaking about, this is speaking of Hezekiah, and it reads, Oh, man, let's pick it up, verse 3, actually. Might as well, right? Verse 3. And he did that which was right in the sight of the Lord, according to all that David his father did. Verse 4. He removed the high places, that's illegal places of worship, and break the images, and cut down the groves, and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. I mean, they started worshiping it. For unto those days the children of Israel did burn incense to it. And he called it Neshutan. And they were doing all types of idolatry, all types of wickedness. And worship God. We are supposed to worship the God, the God the way that he said to. And there's only one God. Verse 5. He trusted in the Lord God of Israel, so that after him was none like him among all the kings of Judah, nor any that were before him. Now that's really saying something. You see in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 3, that he opened the doors of the house of the Lord because Ahaz, that was the king before him, just shut down the house of the Lord, closed the doors. But Hezekiah opened them back up, and he had a, a restoration of true worship that was basically unprecedented. I mean, he did things right, got all the wickedness out of the church, all the idols, all the falsehoods, and brought back the true worship of Almighty God. Verse 6, For he clave to the Lord, and departed not from following him, but kept his commandments, which the Lord commanded Moses. Verse 7, And the Lord was with him, and he prospered whithersoever he went forth. That will happen if you try your very best to serve God the way that God said to. And he rebelled against the king of Assyria, and served him not. You very well know the king of Assyria is one of the greatest types for the false Christ. So you're not going to worship the false Christ, are you? He's arriving before we're gathered together to Jesus Christ. You stand against Satan when he arrives as the false Messiah. Now turn over with me to 2 Kings chapter 20. Now we're really going to get down to see a beautiful connection, which is one connection of many to these Songs of Degrees. And you have an appendix in your companion Bible all about the Songs of Degrees. It's appendix number 67, where you just get um, over and over and over all these different things that connect you to Hezekiah in these chapters 120 to 134 of the book of Psalms. Remember, God's Word proves itself. So, 2 Kings chapter 20, verse 1, and it reads, In those days was Hezekiah sick unto death, and the prophet Isaiah, the son of Amos, came to him and said unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Set thine house in order, for thou shalt die and not live. 
Verse 2, Then he turned his face to the wall and prayed unto the Lord, saying, Verse 3, I beseech thee, O Lord, remember now how I have walked before thee in truth, and with a perfect heart. Hezekiah did not worship idols. He did not partake in false religion. And I've done that which is good in thy sight. And Hezekiah wept sore. I mean, Hezekiah made some mistakes that were pretty big at times, but he never worshipped a false god. And we better never worship a false god either. Verse 4, And it came to pass, afore Isaiah was gone out into the middle court, that the word of the Lord came to him, saying, Verse 5, Turn again and tell Hezekiah, the captain of my people, Thus saith the Lord, the God of David thy father, he's, David is his ancestor, I have heard thy prayer, I have seen thy tears. Behold, I will heal thee. On the third day thou shalt go up unto the house of the Lord. And this I have heard thy prayer. That's going to connect us right to uh, Psalm chapter 120, verse 1, the very first verse in the Song of Degrees. See a connection already. And when it comes to asking the Lord for a healing, never forget James chapter 5, verses 14 through 16. God gives you the instructions. Verse 6. And I will add unto thy days 15 years. How many songs of degrees are there? Fifteen. And I will deliver thee and this city out of the hand of the king of Assyria. And I will defend this city for mine own sake and for my servant David's sake. That is also going to later connect us to Psalm chapter 130 or 132 verse 10. How he said, I did it for my servant David's sake. And of course, what's the city? It's Jerusalem. Verse 7. And Isaiah said, Take a lump of figs. Do you know the parable of the fig tree? Christ said in Mark chapter 13, Learn a parable of the fig tree. And they took and laid it on the boil, and he recovered. Verse 8, And Hezekiah said unto Isaiah, What shall be the sign that the Lord will heal me, and that I shall go up into the house of the Lord the third day? Now he's kind of getting risky here. When God tells you something's going to happen, you really shouldn't say, oh, well, what sign can I get? You just say, okay, you said it. It's a fact. But he asks, verse 9, And Isaiah said, This sign shalt thou have of the Lord, that the Lord will do the thing that he hath spoken. Shall the shadow go forward ten degrees or back ten degrees? Now it's talking about on the sundial. So when the sun, as it gets higher, the sundial will move. And as the sun goes down lower, it'll move. So the Lord's asking, to make it real simple, do you want me to fast forward the sun going up to where the dial moves? Or do you want me to fast forward to where it goes down to make it go backwards? And so that's, that's obviously a very, only God can do that, obviously. Verse 10. And Hezekiah answered, It is a light thing for the shadow to go down 10 degrees. So he's saying that that's just the natural way that as the day gets longer, the shadow is going to go down. That, that's just how it happens. So, so then he says, But let the shadow return backward 10 degrees. So what he asked the Lord to do is that just when the sun is in, for example, if the sun is in the process of going down, he's saying, Lord, make it go back up when it's supposed to be going down. A miracle from Almighty God. So that's the sign that he asks for. Verse 11, And Isaiah the prophet cried unto the Lord, and he brought the shadow ten degrees backward by which it had gone down in the dial of Ahaz. So 15 years, one, we're going to turn back to Psalms 120 at this time, begin these songs of degrees. So you got 15 chapters, these 15 songs of degrees, one for each year that was added on to Hezekiah's life. And then we're going to see in these 15 chapters that four of them are written by David. One of them says uh, for Solomon, so that leaves 10 left over. And it, I think it's very, very likely that those ten were written by Hezekiah himself. One for each degree that God moved the dial. God's word is so perfect. It's so fascinating. So now let's get into it. Psalm chapter 120. And it even says specifically, you'll see the little title or superscription is a song of degrees. And even in the Hebrew, it's the song of the degrees. 
So Psalm chapter 120, verse 1, and it reads, In my distress I cried unto the Lord, and he heard me. We just saw that in the Kings. but So remember what was going on uh, even in a previous time, especially in chapter 18 and 19 of 2 Kings. The king of Assyria was coming to take Jerusalem. There's even in the British Museum, there's a historical artifact called Sennacherib's Cylinder, where Sennacherib says, I took 46 fence cities, and now I got Hezekiah like a bird in a cage. So the king of Assyria was taking all the cities around, and then it was looking like that for someone who didn't believe in God, they would have said, oh, yeah, he's definitely going to take Jerusalem. But he didn't. Why? Because God's on the throne. But when things are looking real bad, what do you do? Do you give up or do you call out to Almighty God? Isaiah, or Hezekiah called out to God. That's what we are to do as well. He hears, verse 2, Deliver my soul, O Lord, from lying lips and from a deceitful tongue. You know that Satan is even the liar and the father of it. John chapter 8, verse 44. And uh, even about, I mean, imagine the flood of lies that's going to be coming out of Satan's mouth when he arrived as the false Christ. Remember, he's going to be disguised as Christ, claiming to be Christ. But once again, what an incredible type we have with the Assyrian. The Assyrian, the actual king himself, he sent Rabshakeh, one of his uh, commanders or whatever, to, to speak to some of the people in Jerusalem. So you can think of the prophecy how Satan is going to be sending his fallen angels around the world. Saying the, the king, the Messiah, has returned. But you know, it's the false Messiah. But this is what it says in 2 Kings chapter 18, verses 29-31. through 31. This is what the king of Assyria tells Rabshakeh to tell the people at Jerusalem. Thus saith the king, Let not Hezekiah deceive you. For he shall not be able to deliver you out of his hand. Once again, this is the words of the evil king of Assyria. Neither let Hezekiah make you trust in the Lord, saying, The Lord will deliver us, and this city shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. Hearken not to Hezekiah, for thus saith the king of Assyria, Make an agreement with me by a present, and come out to me, and then eat ye every man of his own vine, and every one of his fig tree, and drink every one of the waters of his cistern. What a perfect type. So he's, they're saying, don't let Hezekiah tell you the Lord's going to save you. And when Satan arrives, the false Christ, remember, he's claiming to be God. And when he takes over the whole entire world, because he will, he does it by peace and flatteries. Well, like he says here, come and partake of your vine, partake of your fig tree. Satan's just going to be spreading the riches everywhere. You ever read Daniel chapter 11, beginning in verse 21? So we have this perfect type here. But when he, he's going to take over the world, he's going to say, Look, everyone else is worse than me. I've brought peace to the world. I've brought riches, blessings to the world. And the whole rest of the world, except for God's elect, is going to be worshiping him. So when you refuse, they're going to be saying, Where's your God at? They're going to be saying, You're an idiot. But you know that you will remain loyal to the true Christ. Verse, uh, verse 3 in Psalms 120. What shall be given unto thee? Or what shall be done unto thee, thou false tongue? Verse 4. Sharp arrows of the mighty with coals of juniper. God's wrath is going to come down on the deceivers. Verse 5. Woe is me that I sojourn in Meshech, that I dwell in the tents of, in the tents of Kedar, now, Meshech is the offspring of Japheth. You see that in Genesis chapter 10, verse 2. And that will also remind you of uh, Ezekiel 38. And Kedar is an offspring of Ishmael, as you see in Genesis chapter 25, verse 13. But, and they're both mentioned in Ezekiel 27. But what he's basically just saying here is, I live in the midst of just a bunch of wicked people, a bunch of evil all around me. Verse 6. My soul hath long dwelt with him that hateth peace. Verse 7, I am for peace, but when I speak, they are for war. Remember it says in Matthew chapter 5, verse 7, it says, Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the children of God. And yeah, it gets rough when you're surrounded by people that all they think about is hatred and war and doing evil things. 
That'll wear you down a little bit, but not really because you know God's with you. You know God's on the throne. And if God be for us, who can be against us? Like you see in Romans chapter 8. Now we come to 121, a song of degrees. Interesting, uh, this is the only one out of the 15 that in the Hebrew it's just song of degrees instead of song of the degrees. I think it's this one, this chapter. If it's not, it's the next one, but I think it's this one. All right, verse 1. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills, from whence cometh my help. And where was God's throne at this time? Where did God even dwell? In Jerusalem. And of course, you don't, you don't trust in the hills or the mountains. That's made very clear in Jeremiah chapter 3, verse 23. But you put your trust in Almighty God. But remember, at this time, God dwelt, His presence dwelt um, in the Holy of Holies, in the temple, in the tabernacle. It was a tabernacle um, in David's time, but then Solomon's temple got built. So, of course, in Hezekiah's time, it's the actual temple. But God's presence dwelt there behind the veil in the Holy of Holies in Jerusalem. Verse 2, My help cometh from the Lord, which made heaven and earth. Now this, once again, is going to direct uh, or connect us directly to Hezekiah. This is what it says in 2 Kings chapter 19, verse 10 and 11. Thus shall ye speak to Hezekiah, king of Judah. And this is, once again, this is what the words of the Assyrian are saying. Saying, Let not thy God, in whom thou trustest, deceive thee, saying... Jerusalem shall not be delivered into the hand of the king of Assyria. So they're saying, don't, don't trust in your God, because they're going to tell you that your God is the false God, and they're going to be saying that Satan is the true God. But they're going to believe that he's Christ, because he's disguised as Christ, claiming to be Christ. Continuing, Behold, thou hast heard what the kings of Assyria have done to all lands, by destroying them utterly. And shalt thou be delivered? Once again, when Satan takes over the whole world, they're going to be saying, everyone's worshiping him. What are you doing? And don't ever forget Daniel chapter 8, verse 25. Satan by peace shall destroy many. But then you skip down to verse 15 of 2 Kings chapter 19. It says, and Hezekiah, see, they brought this message to him from the king of Assyria saying, oh, don't be deceived. Don't trust in your God. Hezekiah went and took that letter, and he went and spread it before the Lord in the house of the Lord. And this is what it says. And Hezekiah prayed, this is what verse 15 says of 2 Kings 15. It says, And Hezekiah prayed before the Lord and said, O Lord God of Israel, which dwelleth between the cherubims. That's speaking about the Ark of the Covenant is between the cherubims. God's presence dwelt there at that time. Thou art the God, Thou alone, of all the kingdoms of the earth. Thou hast made heaven and earth. So we have it directly connected here. There's only one God. That's our Heavenly Father, Yahweh. You don't care that Satan's going to... I mean, you care, but you're not deceived by the fact that Satan's going to take over the whole world and convince almost the whole world that he's God. You're not going to be deceived because you stick to the Word of God. But yes, of course, we care. It's the saddest thing ever. But the Bible's here. Some choose to, some choose to study it. Some don't. Verse 3. He will not suffer thy foot to be moved. Speaking of, God's not going to allow your foot to be moved. The true God. He that keepeth thee will not slumber. God never sleeps. He's ready to help at any time. And this word keepeth is shamar in the Hebrew. We're going to see it three times right in a row here. And we're going to see that Hebrew word even three more times in this chapter. But how it says he will not slumber, that might remind you of 1 Kings chapter 18, verse 17, where Elijah, he was going up against the Baal prophets. The Baal couldn't bring fire down from heaven. But then, uh, then uh, Elijah started mocking him. He said, maybe your God's asleep. Maybe he's pursuing. Maybe he's just doing something else. See, their God doesn't exist. Because there's only one God, and our Heavenly Father does not sleep. Verse 5. The Lord is thy keeper. That means he guards you. He protects you. The Lord is thy shade upon thy right hand. You just have the Word of God. If you have it sealed in your mind, you're not going to take that mark of the beast in your right hand. 
We studied that a great deal in our very last study when we finished up chapter 119 of the book of Psalms. But this shade, this word, this Hebrew word is even translated as shadow in Judges chapter 9, verse 15. It's basically the first parable in the entire Bible where the bramble bush, he says, come and put your trust in my shadow. And it's the type of Satan. He wants you to worship him. He wants you to trust in him. But there's only problem. He, there's only one problem. Well, there's many problems. But the thing is, he doesn't protect. He doesn't save. He delivers you into deception. He delivers you on the straight that leads to eternal destruction of your soul if you were to worship him at the end of the millennium. I speak of Revelation chapter 20. Of course, well, the reason I put it that way is now there's still a chance. Even if you followed Satan, you still have the chance to repent at this time. Repent and turn to Jesus Christ. But those that follow Satan at the end of the millennium, they will die the second death and their soul will perish. Verse 6. The sun shall not smite thee by day, nor the moon by night. God protects you no matter what might come against you. And with that moon, you might think about the one who had the possessed with the lunatic spirit, moonstruck in uh, Matthew chapter 17, verse 14 through 21, where the, the disciples, they couldn't cast out that evil spirit. They asked Jesus Christ, why could we not cast him out? That he said, because of your unbelief. And then he went on to say that this type goeth not out but by prayer and fasting. And as we just uh, talked about recently here, us together, we talked about how that lunatic spirit, that's probably Satan himself that was possessing that person in Matthew 17. But you see, you don't, Satan's not, you have power over him through the name of Jesus Christ. Luke chapter 10, verse, 13, Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20. And of course, the people that follow Satan today or ever, that's the most wicked thing anyone could ever do. But if you just repent, accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, turn away from the evil, when you accept Jesus Christ as your Savior, you receive eternal life. And like it says in Luke chapter 10, verse 17 through 20, Christ said, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. Because the disciples came back and said, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name, through the name of Jesus Christ. Then Christ said, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. With those serpents and scorpions, that will connect you right to Revelation chapter 9. So why would you fear when God is with you? Use that power in the name of Jesus Christ. Anytime you think it may be necessary, you have the power. You can say you command Satan and all evil spirits out and to go back where they came from to the abyss in the name of Jesus Christ. Utilize that power, but it's only through the name of Jesus Christ. Verse 7. The Lord shall preserve thee from all evil. Not just from some, but all. He shall preserve thy soul. Verse 8. The Lord shall preserve thy going out. He shall preserve thy going out and thy coming in from this time forth and even forevermore. So this isn't just an old thing or a one-time thing. It's forever. But you have to be serving God. You have to be doing things His way. And of course, you have to believe in Jesus Christ because you, that no one comes to the Father except through the Son, Jesus Christ. That's the only way to eternal life. But so this, we have this word preserve three straight times here again. Guess what? It's the same Hebrew word that we had as keep, keeper and keepeth before. So that word shamar, six times used in this chapter. You know six is Satan's number. His number is even 666. In Revelation chapter 13, verse 18. So would you fear Satan? You better not. Why would you? He fears you. If you truly serve Jesus Christ and you use the power of the name of Jesus Christ, why would you fear him? Chapter 122, a song of degrees of David. We're going to see so many twofold, threefold things, prophecies in this chapter. It's amazing. Let's go ahead and go with it. Verse 1. So you see, this applies to David, but it also perfectly applies to Hezekiah. It's fantastic. Of course, many things to teach us. Um, let's go verse 1. I was glad when they said unto me, 
Let us go into the house of the Lord. And that's exactly how we feel when we, when we come to church. I mean, we love serving the Lord. We love praising Him. We love studying His Word. But, and um, so first I'll go with David. David, for seven years and six months, he was at first, he was only king of the house of Judah. But then in 2, Kings chapter 5, or 2 Samuel chapter 5, David took Jerusalem. And then he became king of all 12 tribes of Israel. And I kind of wanted to wait till a later verse to say that, but that's all right. You'll see how that's going to connect with it even more. But so, and then, as I already mentioned with Hezekiah, he opened the house of the Lord. It was shut. I mean, Ahaz shut up the house of the Lord. He shut it down. You, you read in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 3, the first year and the first month, of Hezekiah's reign, I mean, right off the bat, he opened the doors of the house of the Lord and repaired them, set things right. Because he knew that was the most important thing, obviously. Serving God is the most important thing in this world by a million miles. Verse 2, Our feet shall stand within thy gates, O Jerusalem. You know how much God loves Jerusalem from Ezekiel chapter 16. And guess what? That's where His throne is going to be set up forever, for all eternity. You see Revelation 21, New Jerusalem coming down from heaven onto earth. Verse 3, Jerusalem is built as a city that is compact together. The word compact even means joined. And like I said, I just mentioned a second ago, when David became, when he took Jerusalem, he then became king of all 12 tribes, joined together. You see, the house of Judah and the house of Israel are split, even at this time that we're in right now, 2024, I mean. But when Jesus Christ returns, those houses are going to be reunited. You see that in Ezekiel 37. So you see, this is even prophecy of when Christ returns, this chapter is. You're going to see that even more. But for Hezekiah's time, you, in beginning in 2 Chronicles chapter 30, you begin to read about a fantastic Passover that Hezekiah brought forth. And of course, it was God that did it, but he used Hezekiah to do it. And it had not, there had not been a Passover like that in many, many years. And you find out in 2 Chronicles 30 that he brought all 12 tribes. And it was such a beautiful thing. Verse 4. I did want to mention also how David took Jerusalem. Those that were at Jerusalem at that time, they, they thought David didn't have a chance because it was such a fortified city. But once again, when God, when God be for us, who can be against us? God gave David the victory. They took Jerusalem. Because you see, Jerusalem, it was all type of heathenism, idolatry, wickedness going on there. But when God gave it to David... It was how it should be, the worship of the true God. Verse 4. Whether the tribes go up, the tribes of the Lord, that's Yah in the Hebrew, the Lord there, under the testimony of Israel, it's talking about the Ark of the Testimony, the Ark of the Covenant, to give thanks unto the name of the Lord. I mean, they gathered to Jerusalem to worship Almighty God. And that's exactly what they're going to do in the millennium. You see it in Zechariah 14. The millennium is that thousand-year teaching period that will begin just after Jesus Christ returns to earth at the second advent. Verse 5, For there are set thrones of judgment, the thrones of the house of David. And prophetically speaking, this will certainly remind you of Matthew chapter 19, verse 28, and Revelation chapter 20, verse 4. Verse 6, pray for the peace of Jerusalem. They shall prosper that love thee. And of course, once again, Ezekiel 16, God loves Jerusalem. So we love Jerusalem as well. But much wickedness goes on in Jerusalem today. Jesus Christ is denied there. Only about 2% of the population of Jerusalem today worship Jesus Christ. But when Jesus Christ returns... At the second advent, then he will be worshipped there once again. And there are, there are still some Christians in Jerusalem. There are righteous people in Jerusalem, but there are many of them. Most are not. Verse 7. Peace be within thy walls, and prosperity within thy palaces. But you see, there, is there peace there today? Of course not. There will not be peace there again 
until there will not be true peace there again until the Prince of Peace, Jesus Christ, returns. He's called the Prince of Peace in Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. But don't ever forget that before Christ returns, before we're gathered to Him, there's going to be the false peace. Satan is going to set up his throne in Jerusalem when he arrives as the false Christ. So do not be deceived. You see that you can read about that deception in Isaiah 14, uh, Mark 13, and many all throughout the book of Revelation, many, many other places. The false peace will come first. Verse 8, For my brethren and companions' sake, I will now say, Peace be within thee. Of course, don't be selfish. We, our job is to bring others to Jesus Christ. Verse 9 to complete. Because of the house of the Lord our God, I will seek thy good. Speaking of Jerusalem, because you see at Hezekiah's time and at David's time, the house of the Lord was there. Is the house of the Lord to there today? No, it's not. Jesus Christ is denied there. And that's the worst thing ever, but we cannot wait till the true Christ returns. His throne will be set up in Jerusalem. There will be true peace there once again. But don't ever forget that, de that deception of Satan as the false Christ will happen first. He's going to set up his throne in Jerusalem. Do not be deceived. Let's go to our Father's throne. Yahweh, Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. In this place you've given us, we can teach your word. We thank you for peace of mind that you give us wherever we are. And we, we know, like it says in John chapter 4, how we, we learn there that we don't have to go to a certain place to worship you, Father. We know we can worship you every, anywhere and everywhere. We thank you so much for that. We thank you for your many blessings and for sending your Son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross and resurrect for us. We ask you to continue to give us understanding, not just for ourselves, but so we can share them with others. Thank you, and we love you so much, Father. In Yeshua, Jesus Christ's precious name, amen. Christian Church in Kokomo, Indiana by Pastor Jesse Sisk. God bless.